What do we do when our plans fall through and when our hearts are troubled? Is your heart troubled by everything that's been going on in the past two months? One of the most popular things I've seen shared on Facebook over the past couple of months is this Venn diagram. Maybe you've seen it too. It's got three separate categories. The first is people taking COVID-19 seriously. The second is people worried about expansion of authoritarian government policies. And the final category is people very concerned about impending economic devastation. And of course, in the middle is me. Does this describe it for you in some way or another? It's not necessarily that you're afraid or they have the wrong perspective either. You fully trust God with each and every one of these things that's going on, but you do have godly concerns at the same time. You see a number of things that are happening that you know aren't good, that the Bible itself says aren't good, and it is concerning. Jesus' disciples once found themselves in a similar situation. It's late in Jesus' ministry. In fact, it's about as late as you could get. It was the evening before Jesus died. He and his disciples are gathered in the upper room, and Jesus is talking to them about how one of them would betray him and how they would all deny him and how he would be taken away from them. I mean, talk about a bunch of concerns, yet that's where Jesus shared with them the words of this coming weekend's gospel reading. And they are words that speak very much to our anxious hearts also. So let's listen as Jesus speaks to us here in John chapter 14. We'll read verses 1 through 12. I have the wrong reference here. Give me a second. John 14, verses 1 through 12. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. This is the word of the Lord. And... There's a lot there we could talk about. It's a dense section. But did you notice something interesting about Jesus' response here? There's one place he doesn't point the disciples. He doesn't say that he's going to fix these problems that they face right then and there. Instead, what does he tell them? In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And... You don't need to see the Father, you've seen me. And 
uh, even though, yes, I, I will be taken from you. In other words, Jesus is basically saying to them, someday, I will fix these problems for you someday, but not today. Let me ask you, just as I ask myself, is that something you need to hear right now? Could it be there are times in our lives, such as right now, where God allows things to fall apart simply so that we would see this isn't the mansion. I'm not home yet. Or as good as this is, this isn't all that God can offer. And I'll see that someday. Truth is, we may want to pat ourselves on the back and say, I'm not afraid. I know that God's in control, but at the same time, I've got a right to be ticked about this because God talks about this in the Bible and he says it's bad. I mean, if we're not careful, aren't we really just looking for some poor substitute for heaven here on earth? Do our concerns or perhaps even our fears overcome us in much the same way as the disciples' fears did for them? Do we sincerely, sinfully begin to look at Jesus more as a political, temporal Savior who should make my life look a certain way now rather than look at him as our Savior from sin who will give true paradise, yes, but someday. Keep in mind, the disciples struggled with all of that until, well, after Jesus rose from the grave. And so during times like this when your heart is troubled, when it is even led to despair, see Jesus. See that the answer isn't found here. It will never be found here, but the Jesus whom we find here, he is the way. He crucified our sin and all evil. He killed it and he buried it. He rose in victory over it. I suppose that means you could say that it's not really a Venn diagram, at least not as God sees it. Instead, there's really only one circle that God wants us to be found in. If I can keep it up. <laughs> um, there, as you can tell, this one is my own. Um, God wants us here. He wants us in this circle. He wants us to be sure we have Jesus. Because when you're in that circle, when you know what Jesus means for you, when you see that he is the way, the truth, the life, the, the way out of everything, well, none of the rest of this stuff matters. It's on the outside because it will all go away. But that won't. May God grant your heart peace in Christ. We'll see you this coming weekend for worship.